Hi, this is Dino Cazares from the group Fear Factory, and you are watching me on Richard Metal Fan. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews. And here we are at episode 100 of Richard Metal Fan Interviews. Crazy that we're at this point, but today's guest, I have the absolute honor to have the one and only Dino Cazares, best known as the guitarist for Fear Factory. He also used to play in Brugera, and he also was in... Uh, Divine Heresy, and probably a plethora of other projects that I don't even know about. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's go talk to Dino. So what's up, guys? I have the absolute honor and a privilege to speak with the, the great Dino Cazares from the almighty Fear Factory. So how are you doing today, Dino? I'm doing great. Uh, it's a couple days before Christmas, and I got all my holiday shopping done. And I uh, had a little bit of time uh, just to be able to speak to you today, which I think is really cool and uh should be fun yeah and this is a special one because because you're now my 100th interview Ooh, well thank you very much yeah so basically this format is i want to do a quick rundown of your catalog as well as like your journey as an artist from where you started to now but before we go into that i want to dive right back into the very beginning or like the first okay. bands that got you into metal what made you want to start playing guitar well the first band that really started uh wanting me to play guitar was acdc angus young from acdc uh, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but I was like nine, nine years old. And I saw him playing on TV and it, it was like the minute I seen it and I saw him, you know, rocking up and down and just the way he plays, I was like, that's exactly what I want to do. And I've never strayed from that dream since when I was nine years old. And, um, yeah. And here I am now. Yeah. All right. And of course, a lot of people know you from Fear Factory, a little bit from Brugera, Divine Heresy. But what were your bands like even before like Fear Factory and Brugera, if you were in any? Um, I was in a band called The Douche Lords in Los Angeles. And it was me and a, a few of my friends. And we were kind of like a like an FD type band. I was like 1987. Um, then I was also in a grindcore band for like a month called excruciating terror um i was in a, another side band called ulceration which we were kind of like a god flesh god flesh rip off and that was with uh with burton c bell he was in the band at, um that's where i first one of the first uh uh ways that i started jamming with him and then um eventually you know i, I linked up with raymond herrera and then we started fear factory from there Awesome, and, and of course, before before Fear Factory, you were a, a, in a Brugera. Right? Tell me about like the the demon. I can I probably can't probably gonna butcher it. Demoniaco. <laughs> Di, Demoniaco. 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 Demoniaco, which means demon maniac yeah. or maniac <laughs> demon. Yeah. Or however, however you want to say it, yeah. but uh, it's very short. Yeah. It's only six minutes, but it's just ugh, an ass beater. Yeah. That was kind of uh, born out of, uh, that was like 19, I want to say Christmas 1988, 19, uh, then we, in 1989, we came out with that, with that uh, little seven inch. But how that started was we were on a radio show, college radio show in Los Angeles called the Adam Bomb Show. Now that's a guy named Pat Hoyd, who's a, he was a, he was a punk rock bassist and he also, did interviews on his college radio station um, with, you know, various bands through Los Angeles, you know, Suicidal Tendencies, you name it, a lot of bands he interviewed. So we were hanging out on his Christmas radio show in 1988, and we saw a newspaper that said Brujaria on it, and it had, on the front cover, it said Brujaria really big, and it had, like, all these pictures of all these dead bodies and, and like, um, uh, uh like a satanic ritual type of thing where you see like little cauldrons of blood and little things that they stir and just all kinds of shallow graves and just all kinds of stuff and we really got intrigued by the story that we decided on the air uh live on the air to say hey we're starting this band called Brujeria and we you know we didn't even like have any music or nothing like that it just was the spur of the moment and he announced it on the radio, this band called Brujeria, to watch out. So once he, once he said that, we're like, okay, we need to record something. So the following year, we recorded that first 7-inch called Demoniaco. 
and it was me, a guy named John Lepe, which is his AKA is Juan Brujo, Pat Howard on drums, which was the DJ on the radio station, and uh, Billy Gould on bass oh, wow. from Faith No More. Oh, wow. Faith I didn't even Gould. know he was in that band. Yeah, so and me on guitar, and then that's just how it started. All right, and then I know and it progressed from there. Yeah, and that, I know, and also in '92, you did the second EP, Matt Machetazos. 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 I'm, I'm Machetazos. bad at pronouncing. I'm bad at pronouncing <laughs> shit, so forgive me. What was it's that, all right. What was that like? It was because I know it's a little bit longer. It's that one's like ten minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> that one, Machetazos, is uh, means to be machete hat. Yeah. And on the cover of that record is a guy. Actually, it's a woman who got hacked up uh, with a machete, which was pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, all these photos came from, um, it's called, it's, it's a murder, it's called, we call them the murder mags. But what they are is newspapers that would come, Mexican newspapers that would come out and they would show like all the dead bodies and all the assassinations and people who've gotten killed, car wrecks. Um, you know, stabbings, shootings. They would show it all in this magazine. And you read the story that goes along with it. It's pretty crazy. Um, but it, but also, in the middle of the magazine, they also had... That's actually a newspaper. In the middle of the newspaper, they also had the hot chick centerfold. You know what I mean? Yeah. In, in, in the middle of all this death and murder and drama and just all kinds of stuff, you know, you had the centerfold still of this hot Mexican girl. Yeah. So that was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so we took a lot of the pictures from there. We took a lot of the ideas from there. Um, and, and we took a lot of the concepts and the stories from those magazines as well. All right. And then go, switching topics to Fear Factory, because I, kn I know no, this wasn't released till 2002, but really the first release was technically concrete. Tell me a little bit about that. And I was curious why, why it wasn't released until 2002. Well, Concrete was produced by a, a friend of mine at the time was named uh, Ross Robinson. And, you know, he saw uh, what the band was doing, uh, Fear Factory, and he was really into it. And so he started his own production company, and he wanted to sign Fear Factory to this production company. Um, but before we signed any deals, we went in and recorded this album called Concrete, and, or Concreto which means concrete in Spanish. And um, we, um, we ended up uh, recording it at Blackie Lawless from Wasp. He had a studio and we recorded it in his studio at night. We were, uh, Ross Robinson was basically working out of the studio there and we were stealing studio time and we were going in there late at night to record this record pretty much, you know, for, basically nothing and um so we finished the album and ross wanted us to sign this uh contract but you know I, our lawyer advised us not to sign the contract so it, it turned into a dispute this was our first legal dispute <laughs> with anybody that we've ever had and we basically were able to keep our songs but he was able to keep the recordings so he was able to keep the master recordings but he wasn't able to release them, and then and we were able to uh, keep our songs, so <clears throat> and still own our songs, <clears throat> which later on, half that record was on Soul of a New Machine. Yeah, and I and the, the and of course, like this year is also the thirty year anniversary of this album. Like, kind of like two questions in one. What was like the thought process recording this album? And is there a chance maybe we can get a celebration of this somehow? Maybe do a tour you played start to finish. Yeah, well, by that time, by the time we got around to recording Soul of a New Machine, um, I already had a few uh, experiences in production because, you know, Fear Factory, we did two demos um, and we did actually three demos uh, and we did, you know, the album. So we were already pretty much getting experience in the studio. We signed a Roadrunner Records um, because of Max Cavalera helping us get signed to the label. Oh, wow. And a guy named Monty Connor. Uh, yeah, I met Max in 1991. And I played him the Ross Robinson album demo. And he was really in love with it and told Monty about it. So that's how we got signed. 
But yeah, so Monty Connor signs the band, and then we he wanted us to use Colin Richardson, which we weren't opposed to using him at that time because he did a lot of our favorite bands, like you know, from Napalm Death to Carcass at the time. Um, but uh, so we ended up using Colin Richardson, and we went into a studio here in Los Angeles called Bears. No, it was called uh, Grandmaster, and it was it was on uh, in between Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard. And so we went into there. We went in there to record. But the trippy thing was is that we had just gotten past the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. Oh, this is oh, 1992, shit. and and we had just gotten past that. So when Colin Richardson, who's from England, when he landed in Los Angeles, he pretty much landed right into the thick of things. You know, we we had the National Guards on the street. Um, at the time we were starting to record, you had to be in your house by 10 o'clock. There was a curfew. It was a citywide curfew at 10 o'clock. And so we had, we had to be done recording by 10 by 9.30 every night and make it back to our where we were staying before 10. If not, they would, you know, obviously question you or possibly throw you in jail. That's what they said. So, you know, and so when we were in the middle of that recording, and then finally, um, when the recording was done, the citywide uh, curfew was lifted. And so we were able to uh, celebrate at a bar after the record was done. Yeah. And what was like the touring cycle for Soul of the New Machine? Shane, did you like go overseas for the first time or did you just stay local in California? Well, the first tour that we did was in Mexico. We did like three shows in Mexico. Uh, a friend of mine, Fernando, took us to Mexico, and we did uh, a handful of shows, and then we came back, and then we started our, our first U.S. tour with uh, Sick of It All and Biohazard. And that was very much a eye-opening experience because what a lineup! Yeah, those guys, you know, they're amazing live back there in 1990. You know, three, they were amazing live, and we definitely learned a lot from those guys. And a shout out to Sick of It All and Biohazard for taking us out. And, taking the chance and taking out a pretty much a death grind core industrial band at that time, yeah. you know, it's completely, completely different than what they were about. Um, and then after that, we um, did a European tour with brutal truth, which was, which was killer. It was uh, 30 shows in like 30 days. It's crazy. Oh. Oh. And then we came back and we did a tour with obituary and then we did a tour with Sepultura. Nice. And that was pretty much our, uh, we were pretty much done with the tour. And 94 is when we went into recording, um, writing and recording for D Manufacture. Yeah, which we'll get there in a second. But I also want to jump right back into Brugera because in 93, you also did Mantando Guerreros. Uh, so, and I think I like that that album. I, I know it's a, more of a shift in sound. It's like a pure grindcore, which is as late in, from the band as later. It's more, later on with the albums after you left, it was more of a death groove sound. Well, see, what happened was is that, you know, in 92, we finished Soul in a Machine. I convinced the record company roadrunner records to sign brujeria and so 92 was sold the machine the following year uh actually that christmas 92 that christmas we went into record the first record called matando huevos which means kill kill whitey basically what it means it's it's all it was all based on uh well i, I call it border politics um which is like you know all the drug cartels want to want to basically take over the borders because whoever controls the borders controls the drugs, drug truck tra trafficking, right? Um, and all the politicians always use the borders as a tool to, you know, help them. They, they politicize the borders, all politicians, whether it's governors, mayors, presidents, they all politicize the borders. So the record was pretty much... Um, um, basically what it was, it was, uh, we were supposed to be these satanic drug lords from Mexico and we were supposed to be kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's basically a bag. The intro starts with a bad, uh, with a drug deal gone bad between Mexican cartel and white, white drug lords. Right. 
And so it was a drug deal gone bad. And that's just pretty much how it started. Yeah. But um, yeah, so in 19, by 1983, that first record came out. And their approach on that record was to make it raw and as unpolished as possible. Yeah. And I believe we achieved that on that record. Yeah, and I know this from like 1990 till about 2000. You were like between Fear Factory, doing back and forth with Fear Factory and Brujera. Is there almost kind of like a different like mind frame depending on what band you're? Are there any like similarities or differences? Well, there's there, there's absolutely no similarities. The only similarities is that the fact that I was playing guitar in both bands and writing writing the music. You know what I mean? So, but for me, the mindset was at the I think it's self-explanatory. You gotta. Obviously, at Fear Factory, we're talking about futuristic concepts, and we were trying to go more um, uh, defined riffs and you know, syncopated uh, kick drums and guitars, and we were going for a more mechanical vibe. Whereas uh, Brujeria, I got into more of like, what would this sound like if it was recorded in a barn in Mexico? You know what I mean? So you want to make it as raw as possible. So um, my mindset was more of a looser vibe, less polished, um, more grindcore-y, you know, uh, 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 approach, and and in somewhat a little bit of a, a simpler, more punkier type of thing. I don't like using that word, but kind of more, you know, for for lack of better words, kind of like of that style. So it was like a grindcore you know, crusty punk and, you know, metal all thrown in there together. So obviously I was able to separate the two because it's very, the two concepts were completely, were completely different. So it wasn't hard for me to get into that mindset to write for Bolivia or Demanufacturing or Fear Factory. Yeah. And speaking of Fear Factory, 95, you dropped the, alleged, the, the masterpiece known as Demanufacture. Sure. And I think this is my opinion, my favorite Fear Factory album. I'm pretty sure every fan could, can can say, agree with that so but usually with the the su second album um well with the debut you have your like your entire life and your career to to write write it and then there's always hype with the first album but when it came time for demanufacture did you felt like pressure to follow up soul of the new machine um the only pressure that we had was basically the pressure that you know we put on ourselves you know i definitely put a lot of pressure on myself to <laughs> write the record um, I be, we, we, I basically wrote me and Raymond wrote all the music in three months for D manufacture. Um, we basically learned from all the recordings that we've done over the years. We also learned that how to basically not put so many songs on a record. Sullivan and machine had 17 songs. D manufacture has 11 songs. So basically what we did is we went, um, when we, me and Raymond first started writing for the record, we were like, okay, we're going to concentrate on 11 songs and not you know not add so much filler in technically technically uh d manufacture was only supposed to be 10 songs but the ra label really liked the song dog day sunrise when we covered it they asked us to put it on the record that was technically supposed to be a b-side so i ended up putting it on the record and you know it was it was a good track some people like it some people don't like it but you know, it was it was a great track. I thought, and I think I thought it fit really well in between. I think it broke up each part of the record, each each side of the record. You know what I mean? Because I put it directly in the middle of the song. Um. So yeah, so we went in, and obviously we we, we started we started recording again with Colin Richardson, and um, we didn't meet Colin and I didn't see eye to eye in the production, and I felt like idea wise and how i wanted this record to sound had pretty much surpassed how he was approaching the record so i ended up uh recruiting reese fulber and a guy named greg Gleedy to handle the rest of the production and the mixing of the album and the rest is history awesome and then i know also that same year you did another brujere album raza odia Yada, tell me about like that. Razio Yada, I took over the production uh, side of things. Um, and I wanted it to be a more, like, again, my, the, the approach that I took on D-Manufacture, I wanted to concentrate on the, you know, the, 
the the best songs that I had and then go in and put do a better production on the record. And so at this point, I re uh, recruited Raymond Herrera to play on the album, which was, you know, he was the guy that I had that connection with. If, when I went to do Razio the other, I, I was like, okay, I needed to make the songs better and I needed a better drummer because, um, you know, Raymond came in and we really just honed in on that and just made it sick. Yeah. And then and that was a, that was another border politic. Sorry. That was another border politic, border politic type record. It was called it was, Razo Yada means hated race. And it was just all the hate that the, you know, the, the Mexicans coming into California across the border, all the hate they were getting and all the racist hate that they were getting, which still is relevant today, yeah. you know, um, all the hate that they were getting. And, um, and it was just a, it was a record about that, and it was also a, it was also a political record about the politics that were happening in Mexico as well. Um, so it was a mixture of all kinds of stuff, and and it, the record came out great. And Jella Biafria, the singer of Dead Kennedys, also did the intro to that record. Yeah, wow, damn, I never knew that. Yep. All right. And then going back to Fear Factory, you dropped another great masterpiece, Obsolete. This is probably like my second favorite Fear Factory album. What was that like going from Demanufacture to Obsolete? Well, there was a there was obviously by the time Demanufacture came out, there was obviously a shift in music. <coughs> yeah. You know, a lot of the mid '90s new metal bands were coming out at that time. Yeah, like so corn had, and stuff. Corn, Limp Bizkit, you name it, Deftones, and all these bands started coming out, right? And yeah. so um, we decided to, you know, uh, also a lot of people accused us on D Manufacture that we were using programmed drums, you know, this is all fake, you know, blah, 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 blah. Now, you got to remember when we recorded in 1994, there was drum machines and there was things like that. There was samplers and stuff like that, but... You know, we didn't really own any of that stuff. That all, you know, a lot of that programming stuff came from Reese Fulber. But we, this is all, this was all natural uh, when we recorded D Manufacture. That's us playing. It's just the, it's just the sounds that we used. We're trying to, we're trying to go for more industrial sound. Where on Obsolete, you know, things were getting, you know, music was getting more groovier. Things were getting more, uh, the mixes were becoming more fuller, more a lot more uh, bass tones, a lot more natural tones, you know, on people's records. So we were like, okay, how do we adjust to that era and that timing of uh, of music that was going on? You know what I mean? Because we like to be relevant as much as possible, right? Right. So we're like, okay. So the first thing we did is we started and started to write more groovier tracks. Because if you listen to uh, D Manufacture, every song, or just about every song had one tempo, right? And there was not a lot of groove on that record. I mean, it's, it's ripping, it's cool, it's, it's cool as hell, don't get me wrong. But the, the groove compared to Obsolete and D Manufacture were night and day. So we wanted to do a groovy, we wanted to do a more groovy, organic record. You could also tell by the album cover, just the colors that we chose were two completely different colors. Obviously, it had more of a bluish, a cold steel, you know, look to it, uh, more mechanical look. Then you had Obsolete, that had the spine and brain that was a more earthy tones, like a brown, brownish tone to the record. So... Obviously, we were trying to go for two different things. So when, you know, a, a great song to talk about, Edge Crusher. Mm -hmm. Heavy, heavy song. Um, and we were specifically trying to write a song with no double bass. And we achieved that. And um, um, it was like, because D Manufacture was pretty much, you know, 90% double bass all the way through, you know. Yeah everywhere whereas uh, you know a song like obsolete we wanted to be fat groovy no double bass you know we wanted to groove out the tempos you know groovy wrists we wanted to, to 
have more of an organic sound um, as far as the drums and stuff like that. And, you know, even songs like Shock, that's all fat groove. I mean, but the kicks are still doing the patterns. So we still had the syncopated kicks in some of the, in a lot of the songs. But, you know, songs like Resurrection and Descent and Edge Crusher, one of those songs that have like no, no double bass kick drums in it. And just to try to see where we could take that. And I thought that we were very successful. Also, it took us a year to write and record that record. So we took a long time. We knew this record needed to be, we knew this record needed to be the next level. And we feel like we, we, we were able to do that. And so there you go. Oh yeah. And it, I still love obsolete. Absolutely. And I heard it's also like you, you guys is like first concept out album but what was like the inspiration of like we should make obsolete a concept album well we've always were into it we you know like if you look at the titles from the very beginning um uh, so excuse me soul of a new machine is basically the birth of this machine that's basically what we were trying to say and that's what we were trying to say as far as the concept it's the birth of this idea maybe we didn't exactly have the gone <laughs> excuse me we didn't exactly have the concept written out but we had the concept and the sound that we were going for. You know, it was in the beginning stages. So that's why we call it Solve New Machine, because basically <coughs> it's a, a, a you know a fetus being born from machine from a machine. So that's basically a concept within itself. When demanufacture, the concept started to become more relevant. And then by the time obsolete came along, we were like, okay, we need to write, we need to write out the concept. But even going back to demanufacture, you know, when we sent out uh, the synopsis for the album, you know, it was written on a sheet of paper with the album cover on one side and the sheet of paper, uh, the, the, the concept on the other side. So we were sending out that to the, to the press. So the press were able to read about this concept. But when we went into Obsolete, um, we wanted to write the whole concept within the book, inside the 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 book of the album, right? Uh, right? We just thought it was it was we just thought it was the next level and it was the next thing that we should you know, that we needed to do. Um, and also, we wrote the synopsis of the album and we sent that out to the press as well. And the press kind of didn't get it. Um, you know, D manufacturer, we were getting five out of five, ten out of ten ratings, hundred out of a hundred. It was all the way across the board you know, the top, the highest you can go. But when Obsolete came out, we were getting like four, four and a half out of five, you know, not eight out of a 10. You know, for some reason, the, the people at the time didn't really get the concept idea. You know, you got to realize, you know, music was much more simpler at that time in the mid-90s, you know, like, you know, Corn and Deftones and, and, and you know, Liskit and stuff like that. You know, which is very straightforward, you know, simple party, party rock, party metal. You know what I mean? Yeah. And here we were, we were coming out with a very simple, con I'm sorry, here we were, we were coming out with a very co complicated concept, futuristic concept of how the world was shifting and things were going to become obsolete. Yeah. You know, you had a song, you know, you had a song like Resurrection, you know, with a corn adidas all i want to do is fuck what it's called all, all, all day, day i dream, I... About, dream about sex it's yeah a... then you had a song like obsolete which talks about how the future is shifting and you know we uh you know we want to uh you know just where how things are becoming obsolete right and how mankind was changing and this world was changing then you had corn freak on a leash you know it's like it's you know there are two completely th different things this and I could see where the journalists were at at that time because they were yeah. more on the corn tip and on the <laughs> tip and on those that kind of concepts, right? So all of a sudden, you know, a record like Obsolete kind of killed that party. The the whole it was a more of a serious concept, and it was a more of a of um you know a more intellectual, well thought out you know concept, and journalists at the time just didn't get it so we were getting less reviews 
you know, which I think obviously is one of the one of our um, best records, and it's the it's the first time that we were able to show people the full concept of where we were at. And I just thought it went over a lot of journalists' heads. All right. And since you, you have all like these concepts, do you ever thought about like expressing it in like like different like types of medias, like like in like a movie or even like a book? Well at that time, yes, we did. But I don't know, you know, just you, you, you start getting into touring mode and we just tour like crazy on that record. We were touring like I mean from D manufacturer to obsolete, we were touring like crazy. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we were not home at all. I mean, I did, I literally did not have a home. I, I put all my stuff in storage and I went on tour for six years straight, pretty much. Oh shit. That's, you know, when I came home, I came home, you know, I was home for a couple of weeks. I I crashed at buddies, friends' houses, or I literally just got a hotel. You know what I mean? Uh, Because I would, I know two, two weeks later I was going to be on tour again. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um so yeah so you know we were torn like crazy so you know we just didn't really have the opportunity or the money really to do a full movie and stuff like that but uh it was always in the back of our minds yeah yeah could you see yourself like doing that in like the near future or something with well i kind of did on the new record aggression continuum where i actually started doing some of the uh, more visual concept stuff on video yeah yeah with disruptor and recode yeah yeah it's fucking great i would love to see like i know like metallica did something where they did like music videos for like every song on the album i could see you like try to do that that with like the next year factory album almost like it make it like a movie in a way yeah i would have loved to do that for obsolete or even d manufacturer but at the time we just didn't have the money you know record contracts were a little different back then and we just weren't there yet we weren't there as far as financially we didn't really actually start making money till late obsolete era you know what i mean yeah where we were able to headline and tour ourselves and that's when we were making some money but you know going into digi mortal you know yeah, there was also there. there was also another shift in music you know what i mean yeah. um and and just where the landscape was at the time in the world but uh I don't know if you want to get into that record yet. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, before that, in 2000, you did your last album with Brujera, Brujerismo. Well, what was that that whole recording process like? And yeah. what was the reason for leaving the band, if you, yeah. you, know, if you can Bru- talk about it? Yeah, Brujerismo is basically like saying like Satanism, but it's it's black madism, as I guess you would want to call it. Um, our record was, uh, our idea and the concept of that record was trying to go a little bit more uh, satanic and a little bit more uh, also concepts, but we were taking, we were doing, you know, uh, different concepts. Like we were talking about Phil Dal Castro and different world beaters that were pretty much um, not exactly the best. Um, um, you know, we had a, we had a Cuban song on the record. Pablo, um, who was it? Um, it was about Fidel Castro. I can't remember the name of the song at the time at the moment, but yeah, the record was, uh, again, I wanted to make it a more, more polished record. We recorded it in Los Angeles, but we went to Monterey, Mexico to mix the record, uh, me and the singer. And there we were adding more of the concept and more ideas um, in the production side of it. And uh, yeah, we wanted to make a killer record. And the first track, Brujerismo, that's, that's fucking one of my favorite songs. Um, yeah. And that, that's me and uh, Nick Barker was on drums on that track. Oh yeah, one of my all-time favorite drummers plays with Cradle of Filth and Jimmy Borgir. Yeah, and I played bass and guitar on that song, and uh, of course Brujo did the vocals. Um, you know, uh, but I'm gonna shoot. I'm I'm gonna move. I'm gonna like have to jump a, a few years. So we did the record. Obviously, um, also I did Did You Mortal as well. Um, there you go. Yeah. yeah and the concept, the, 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 you know, obsolete had gone gold in America. Um, we, the label really thought it would be a gr- better idea to, you know, commercialize some of our sound a little bit. So they sent in record producers, um, you know, the type of producers that give you ideas and 
try to leave you, lead you in a certain direction. So they send in a couple of, they send in like three producers and we pretty much fired them all pretty much in the, or at least I did. I wasn't really into the idea. The rest of the guys were into the idea of bringing in these producers to help us write a record because the record company wanted us to be platinum artists because at that time, you know, the whole new metal scene yeah. was at its peak. Yeah, it was 2001 at one when this album came out. I know like other bands, like Papa Roach, Linkin Park, Park and shit were like at the, the, were like popping up at, or like newer at the time. Yeah, and I, I mean, I mean, I mean, Papa Roach did about what five million on the first record. Linkin Park did like ten million on their first record. So the label was thinking that we could be that next band to be there like that. I didn't, I didn't, but the rest of my band members did, and that's kind of like where the tension started to brew between me and the band is because the band, the other three members were for it. And I was kind of, and I was for it for a couple of songs, but I wasn't for it for a whole record. So I was really trying to put my foot down on that, which caused a lot of tension between me and the band. Um, so there was three producers that came in that the record label sent in. And I was like, no, no, they got it. They got to go, you know? So, I I was I basically fired I didn't fire I just didn't continue working with these producers so um I remember we're just in the writing process of the album we're not even into the production side yet we're yeah. just in the writing process so they send this one guy named Malcolm Springer and he was actually pretty good he actually heard our songs that I had a, I had a written like Lynchpin was a different was slightly different. Another great um, song. Yeah, Lynchpin was 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 basically the biggest song on that record. Still is our biggest song today, by the way. Yeah. Um, just because it had a crossover appeal, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, he helped us arrange that song. He's like, okay, you should cut this part, and then extend this part, and cut this part. And I was like, I you know did the math head. I'm like, that's that's really good. We played it, and I was like, wow, okay, I like that. And then he did the same thing for What Will Become. Hey, that that part you should use for a pre-chorus, and this part you should use for this part. I'm like, fuck, that works. So he didn't actually come in and try to change our music. He came in and just basically helped us arrange the songs. And I was like, wow, okay, I like this guy. Well, he worked on about four songs with us. Um, and one of them was the DJ Mortal track. The other one was um, Dark Bodies. You know, so he, he worked with us on, on a few tracks, on four songs. And I was like, okay, I like this guy. So, you know, so basically when he went into recording the album, we used Reese Fulber and a guy named Mike Plotnikoff to uh, handle the engineering duties and mix the album with us as well. Um, and our approach, our approach was that, just try to be as modern as possible. And, uh, you know, like, again, it, it came, we, we birthed one of our biggest songs, Lynchpin. Now, the record went on to sell a lot of records, but, uh, you know, to the record company, it was a failure because it didn't sell the million copies they were hoping for. Oh, wow. And one of my favorite songs on this album is the song Back the Fuck Up, which features Be Real from uh, Cypress Hill. How'd you end up, how'd you hook up with him to do a song on on there well i made be real in uh i want to say maybe 90, 1999 2000 i met him through fe fellow friends and we became friends and we started hanging out a lot and then um christian who are our bases at the time was like hey i think we need to bring be, be real and cypress hill in on a track um at, f at first i was not having it you know, I was like, oh, I don't know if that's the right direction. I don't think we need to go that full direction of, you know, jumping on the uh, rap rock that was happening. That was really big at the time. Um, but the record label really thought it was a great idea. And so, you know, I said, okay, well, let's do it. We can always use it for a B-side, right? Um, well, we ended up doing the track. Cool track, but <clears throat> now you got me coughing. Sorry. <laughs> but um, I just felt that 
maybe it shouldn't have been on the record. But again, I lost that um, vote and um, that ended up being on the album. Now, for some reason, that song got leaked. I don't know who leaked it, but that song got leaked. And a lot of the fans, a lot of our core fans were like, you know, a little disappointed because they felt that we were jumping in on yeah. the, the rap, rock, metal bandwagon. Right. And so and I can completely understand why they thought that. So the record label thought it was a good idea to put on the record. And I was like, I, I lost that battle and it was on the record. Um, now, not to say that the song wasn't good. I just thought that it was maybe not the song to be on the record and use it as a special B-side track. But it was, it's, it became the most controversial track. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, you did a little bit of touring, but then, of course, in 2002, too, you actually had left Fear, Fear Factory. Rhea, what was the reason for well, you leaving? It was it was a weird situation, because after, uh, after DG Mortal, the touring cycle, um, I felt tension. I felt a lot of tension within uh, the band, especially coming from Burton. I felt a lot of tension. I was like, hmm, are my days numbered here? And it's like they were. So, you know, I felt it. But we went into, I remember Raymond calling and said, hey, we're all going to start rehearsing and start doing songs for the new record. I'm like, okay, great, because I got a lot of stuff written. I got a lot of stuff written that was like, you know, which, what became Divine Heresy. Yeah. You know, a heavy-ass record. I wanted to go back. You know, I thought... <coughs> You know, I thought DJ Mortal was a very, you know, commercialized record. I thought it would be the best approach to do something more ribbon and heavy, you know, style. And um, anyway, so when I got into the studio, um, basically Raymond came in, sat behind his kit. I was already there with my guitar plugged in, ready to go. Christian came in, sat down on the couch. And Burton came in. And... And he had a bottle of whiskey in his hand. And he basically said, I quit the band. Yeah. And then left. And then I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then Christian said, okay, later. And then Raymond said, well, I guess that the band's over. It just seemed like it was planned out. Yeah. Right? And then, I don't know, uh, a month or so later, Raymond comes over to my house and says, hey, you know, we're going to, continue the band but we're going to continue with it without you and i said okay how's that going to work and he's like well burton doesn't want to doesn't want to continue the band with you oh damn and i said okay and i go um all right then we had to work out a lot of the the legalities of me leaving the band it's a lot of shit that went down behind the scenes i don't really want to get into it but yeah a lot of stuff went down and basically i went on um from the time I was out of Fear Factory, yeah, I had assess now. By the time I was at Fear Factory, there was about seven years in between. From two thousand, I'm going to say two thousand three to two thousand nine. Um, I put out five records. Put out two Divine Heresy records, two Assassino records, yeah. and a Roadrunner All Stars records. Yeah, and I toured with Brujeria. I toured with Assassino. I did the Roadrunner All Stars show, record and show, uh, and I toured Divine Heresy. Yeah, so awesome. I was definitely very, very busy. Yeah. Um, and at that time, I put out five records. And at that time, they put out two records: Archetype and Transgression. Yeah. So I was very busy. I was also helping the record uh, record company Roadrunner Records sign bands. I got Cold Chamber. I got Spine Shank. I brought them Static X. I brought them System of a Down, uh, In This Moment, Earshot, and, a, and a, a few other bands. And they signed all of them. Um, but yeah, so I was definitely really busy. I was very involved in the local scene. I was touring all, all across South America. I was doing van tours with Divine Heresy in the U.S. Um, touring with Brujeria, touring with Asesino. Yeah, and so I, I was a very busy dude. Yeah, yeah, but tell me about the Assassino you know, albums because because nobody ever really talks about that. Yeah, 
I was, you know, you know, I wanted it to be brutal on the ground. I didn't, I didn't really care so much as to make it popular or it to be as, um, as like brujeria. You know what I mean? Like where it was more popular because when I left brujeria in two thousand. I'm not even sure. I want to say 2010. I was I left Brujeria. It was 2005, actually, according no, to Metal it? Archives. Yeah, they're wrong because I was still touring with the band at that time. Oh damn. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the Metal Archives gets a lot of lot of things wrong. Yeah, I read it's it. It's like Wikipedia almost. Yeah, I noticed that they kind of share some of the same stuff. Wikipedia is wrong. Like the number one thing that's wrong on Wikipedia, the first, the first sentence. On Wikipedia about Fear Factory, it says that we started in 1989, which is not true. Oh, yeah. It was, it was 1990, October 31st, 1990, which I celebrate every year yeah. on Facebook and all our social medias. And I don't know why they don't, they haven't changed it or got it right. I think, now, it, was I think it was because that you were originally were called Ulcer no. Ulceration. See, that's, that's another thing. You see, you're going by Wikipedia as well, too. No, Ulceration was just a side project band. That well, it was just a band that me and Bert had that sounded like Godflesh. Oh. That was it. Uh -uh. It was a completely different thing. Yeah. Me and Raymond had another band. Well, Raymond's in a band called Extreme Death in Los Angeles. I joined his band for like a month because I wanted to jam with Raymond. Raymond, we had a different singer, um, uh, and it was called Extreme Death. It was a horrible name. I was telling Raymond we needed to change the name. So I was jamming with Raymond in one band. I was jamming with Raymond in jamming uh, with Burton in another band. And then the singer of the band that I was jamming with, Raymond, had quit the band. So I said, Raymond, th this is a perfect job to me. Let's just change the name. And I, I know another guy who's a great singer. I'm playing with him in another band. So we brought him, we brought Burton into that band, right? I took him from Ulceration, which was my other project band. Took him from that, brought him into what became Fear Factory. Uh -huh. So I had... So no, Fear Factory was never called Alteration before oh. that. No, oh, they should. You should be on like like Loudwire's Wikipedia Fact or Fiction to, to clarify all that. <laughs> Loud Loudwire's never asked me to be on their show, and they've done they've done numerous things on the band Fear Factory. Not that much. We kind of get shunned a lot by a lot of certain things like that. Like like uh, Loudwire put out this this whole video on YouTube where it's like, who started the heavy and the clean vocals you know who started that and they were quoting bands from 1992 you know and uh, we were before that of course but they didn't care i mean we we didn't even get mentioned in the video wow. you know what i mean so i don't really have a lot of um what's the word i don't really have a lot of trust in loudwire yeah, and some like, of the stuff they release so can be, can be full of shit sometimes yeah you know a lot of these people go by wikipedia and they think wikipedia is right but uh, you know i've i've it's tried changing i've tried changing wikipedia quite uh, i mean a lot of times but it always somehow always goes back i don't know why i'll have to, maybe to they, go in there maybe they maybe they go and they they maybe wikipedia you know quotes metal <laughs> archives you know or other sites that get it wrong yeah. but yeah they definitely got it wrong. Yeah, but anyway, but, I know we kind of like got 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 way off topic, but let's go back to Assassino. No, because like I said, nobody okay. really talks about that. Assassino, and that's okay that not a lot of people talk about Assassino because it's, Assassino was very a super niche niche type band, and we wanted it to be brutal and underground and fucking sick. You know what I mean? Um, but we put out two records. Um, one is called Corridos de Muerte, which is Tales of Death. And the other one was called Cristo Satanico, which means Satanic Christ. Um, and it's a full concept record. And it's about a, a, an assassin, a particular assassin for a drug cartel. And um, he, was, uh, he was part of the uh, same drug cartel as, as Brujeria. And um, satanic drug lords. And basically, he broke off and did his own thing. And that's basically what, what the concept started. And it was basically what it was supposed to be was each member in Brujeria 
was going to have its own solo record, kind of like what Kiss did. Yeah, yeah, everyone on solo record, whatever. And so mine was going to be mine was the first one, Asesino, and I knew Tony Campos, uh, who is a singer in Asesino. He's also the bass player of Static X. I knew him for many years before that, and I knew that he could <laughs> sing, and I brought him into Asesino, and it and it worked perfectly, and it was killer. Yeah, yeah, but then also I know you started Defi Divine Heresy, I, which is I love, and I want to talk about Bleed the Fifth, and hard to believe this year it's also the 15 year anniversary of this album. Tell me about that. I just I think this is still a great good album. It's an amazing record. It was my first. Um, no, Asesino was my first record since I, I was out of, of Fear Factory, but yeah. this this was my. Okay, I had did Asesino. Um, Tales of Death, Corridos de Muerte. Then I did the Roadrunner All Stars record. Yeah, I forgot and about All Stars. All Stars. I, I All Stars. That's still a, a great collab album. I think it's you, Matt Hafey from Trivium, Joey Jordison, Sin, rest in peace. And I forget Rob Flynn. Like, Rob, Rob Flynn. Flynn. Yeah. Yeah, we were the four team cat. Ca well, me, Rob Flynn, Joey Jordison, and Matt Hafey were the four team captains. But. Going back to Asesino, so we finished the Asesino record. I did the Road Run All-Stars record in 2000, 2002. It was Corrida de Muerte, Asesino. 2005, 2004 was the Road Run All-Stars. And 2005 was actually the show as well in New York. We did a show. Um, I was touring with Brujeria at that time as well. Um, so right, right around the time, about 2006, I was like, okay, I need to do uh, my own record, um, you know, a, 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 an English speaking record. And so that's when I went and did Divine Heresy. I was like, okay, I need to get, you know, my real band off the ground. You know what I mean? And so at that time, I recruited a guy named John Sankey. He was from Australia, he played from a, a tech, a tech band called, um, uh, devolved and he was really good and actually devolved was a band that uh, did a show with fear factory back in 2002 and Australia. and that's how i heard that's how i heard and seen the band i was like wow this guy's an amazing drummer so we came out to california and he started writing we started writing the album this bleed the fifth um i already had a lot of, a lot of song ideas for it because some of those riffs and ideas were going to be used for uh, 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 a Fear Factory record after TG Mortal, but since that didn't work out, I worked out. I, I teamed up with John, came out to California. He was coming back and forth because he was out here x amount of months because he didn't have a work visa, so he was only here for three months. So within those three months, we wrote a bunch of ideas, got a bunch of different songs, different stuff. Um, he had to go back to Australia, and then. Uh, he, he and then I decided to use Nick Barker um, because John had to go back to Australia and I didn't know when he was going to come back. So I ended up using Nick Barker on a couple of tracks. Um, All Save Yourself. And the other one was called uh, This Thread Is Real. That's me and Nick Barker. But Nick Barker didn't actually play on the record. He didn't actually even play on any demos. Um, <laughs> But we ended up writing. He had to go back to England. Uh, same thing with work visa issues. So we had to go back to England. And then um, in came in Tim Young. And, you know, most of the record was already written by the time Tim Young played on the album. Uh, but I did write a, a few songs with Tim. And so the record pretty much had the idea of three, th a three th there was three drummers pretty much in the writing process of that record. So it was John Sankey, Nick Barker, and Tim Young. And I think that's one of the reasons why the record's so cool. It's because it's got three different drummers jamming with me. So, wow. yeah. yeah. And then going into Bringer of Plagues, I also think this is a pretty good good album. Tell me about that. What was that like going from Bleed the Fifth to, to this? <laughs> okay, well, going into that record, um, I had... By late 2009, I rejoined Fear Factory, yeah. and the other two members of the band, um, Raymond and Christian, didn't exactly agree with Burton on bringing me back into the band. So Burton decided to pair up with me 
and um, Raymond and Christian decided to stay out of the band. Um, we went into write. We went into write mechanize, but at the same time, while we were in the writing process for mechanize, I was already recording, uh, tracking for the bringer of plagues. So the whole time of mechanize and the bringer of plagues, I was literally going to two different studios, writing and recording uh, with two different producers on the record. So it was crazy. So a lot of people have said, yeah, mechanized sounds like divine heresy. And I have to agree with them because some of it does sound like divine heresy because, you know, when I came back into Fear Factory, I wanted to do a, an aggressive album. I'm like, okay, I'm back. We got to come out swinging. We got to make it brutal. We got to make it heavy. We got to make it ripping and we got to make it, you know, as, as, as industrial as possible. And so I believe we achieved that on mechanized. Um, but like I said, at the same time, I was doing Bringer of Plagues. And my, I was exhausted by the time I was done with both those records. I was exhausted because doing two records, two different studios, two different rehearsal spaces, two different writing process, two different writing teams, you know, different producers, different mixers. And it was like, wow. And so, yeah. So both those records came out the same year, 2010. Yeah. Yeah. And then, hold on. And then... We ended up pairing up and touring together. So it was Fear Factory and Divine Heresy touring together. So wow. it was crazy. Well, I can yeah, imagine just get, thinking about getting carpal tunnel from like learning like t two sets. I wasn't worried about my hands. It was more my ears. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And so it's kind of hard to talk about Mechanized and not talk about Bringer of Plagues because they were right. literally working at the same time. Damn, I had no idea you were doing like both at the same time. I thought it was just like you did one and then you did the other. I know you did no. like both at, all together. No. So by the time I was tracking, like in, in the studio, tracking Mechanized, I was mixing the Divine Heresy record at night, late at night. All right. And then tell me about like Mechanized, being that it is your first album with the band in all, almost a decade, did you feel like nervous a little bit coming back? No. Making a new album? No. Come on, man. I already had... How many records did I have under my belt already? Like I had a lot. Five. I had a lot. Yeah. I mean, I can't even tell you how many records I already had. Yeah. You know, I had all the, I had the, the three Burodia records, the seven inches, the Fear Factory demos, all the, all the four Fear Factory records, the two, Asasino records, the two, Divine Heresy records, the Rotor and Ulcers. I already had a lot of stuff under my belt that I already recorded. So no, I was not nervous or really felt any kind of pressure um it just felt good being back yeah being back in the band yeah. being back where i belong and uh you know the writing again the writing process my mindset was to make it as heavy as possible right and what was like the, the, the i know you mentioned you did the double set with like divine heresy and fear factory was that like your first tour like back in fear factory yes it was the first tour back in fear factory during the mechanized yeah Awesome. And then, of course, the, the next Fear Factory album I want to talk about is The Industrialist. I love this album. Probably, like, my third favorite Fear Factory album. But, but I hardly did this year is also 10 years since this came out. Like, like how did that come to be? Well, we, we were doing Mechanize. You know, we had Gene Hoagland on drums. And we had Brian, Byron Stroud on bass. So that was the team that we put together. We put pretty much put half half a strapping young lad on the record you know, um, yeah. during that process. Um, but um, again, on, on Mechanize, okay, this is something I, I forgot to mention. On Mechanize, I also had three different drummers on that record. Um, Gene Hoagland played the majority of their album, and, but he, during, during the recording sessions, he got called to do death clock i wasn't sure if they were putting a record out if they were doing a tour i wasn't sure what it was but he had to leave so it kind of left me with you know uh while i was recording guitars i was like okay there's a lot of things that are, that are missing i think drum wise and so i had called tim young and tim young came in and played some of the parts on the record especially on fear campaign um there's a lot of parts in that midsection that are that are Tim Young's ideas, which was really cool. Um, and then 
on a lot of the, a lot of the record, the majority of it, like Power Shifter, uh, the song Mechanize, uh, the song Metallic Division, um, and there's one Design of the Enemy, and there's a handful of there's a couple other tracks I've kept. I uh, God Eater, you know, a lot of that is me and John Sankey, uh, who the guy originally got for Divine Heresy from Australia. At that time, by that time, 2010 came around, John Sankey was living in Los Angeles. His band had moved here. And so he was living here at this time. And so I was able to utilize him when I needed him for the record Mechanize. So a lot of people don't realize that there's all, actually three different drummer ideas on that record and the same approach that I took to 2007 um, Divine Heresy record, um, uh, Bleed the Fifth. So when I did Mechanize, that's what happened. So Gene kind of left us uh, to go do Death Clock. So um, moving on to the Industrialist, we didn't have a drummer because the negotiations with Gene Hoagland didn't work out. He had a really good offer to go play with Testament at that yeah. time. And so we were negotiating with uh, Gene's manager and it was like he, the kind of money he was asking for was just beyond our reach and more than what we can afford. So we ended up parting ways with Gene Hoagland and we ended up using a drum program because we were, um, we didn't have a drummer. So some people said, yeah, you could just hire a drummer or studio drummer, but this was like, we didn't have any time for that. We didn't really have any time. We were like, okay, we just gotta, you know, hurry up and record this record. We already had all the stuff, already had everything written to go. Um, and that again, that again was John Sankey helping me with the drum programming on the album. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, because, you know, again, you know, like, like I said, Gene Hogan wasn't there. He ended up going to Testament and then we ended up using the drum program. And then when that record came out, um, me and Burton were very honest in our interviews and we, we told people the truth. Hey, we didn't have a drummer. We ended up having to use a drum program, which everybody at that time was already using drum programs. I mean, it became, it was the norm for a lot of records. For some reason, we got, uh, you know, the, 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 the record got really bad reviews. It got a lot of backlash from the fans because of the drum programming. Um, everybody was like, well, you should have just paid Gene. I'm like, no, we, we just... We didn't have the money. We just, it wasn't, he was just asking for a, uh, an insane amount and, you know, blessed testament that they were able to afford him. Um, we just couldn't. And that's what happened. And so for some reason, uh, which I thought was very disrespectful on Gene's part, but he ended up slagging the record as well, um, which I didn't understand wow. why. I didn't understand why. And I don't know why he was so he was already in testament at that time and um he just decided to to uh you could you could pretty much look it up it's all over blabber mouth you know if anybody wants to see that kind of stuff what he was saying about us and we had nothing but great things to say about the guy um you know as far as i know gene he's a very professional individual but for some reason he decided to slag the record and you know talk shit about the album because we used the drum program i know that there are i know that there are drummer elitists Know, who don't believe in that kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, who don't believe in drug programming and, and stuff like that. And I get it. There's a whole scene for that. But, you know, nowadays, every band you can think of is pretty much using the help of some sort of drum programming or some sort of sound replacements or quantizing their drums to be perfect. I mean, every it's become the norm in the last, you know, 15 years. From death metal to tech, tech death metal to you name it to to rock, you know, uh, and but for some reason you know we're an industrial band and we use drum programming and we got ridiculed, <laughs> and uh, Gene definitely added to that. It was it was pretty disrespectful, but it is what it is, and he and he said what he said, and um, and that's it. You know, I I, I still. I feel like I'm still like I'm friends with a guy.
I still see him. I talk to him, which is really cool. But you know, I don't know. I just he, I don't know what what he was thinking at that time. Yeah, that's news to me. I never knew that. I mean, we had parted ways before that. He went, like I said, he was at playing the testament. He was playing the testament at that time. I didn't even think that he would care. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. He took then, the testament off it. So. Yeah. Then moving on to uh, Genexus, I I think what was that like going from the industrial list to Genexus? Because I believe Genexus is also an, another concept album. Yeah. Another thing that I wanted to mention, like even when I when I came back to Fear Factory uh with mechanizing the industrialist i wanted to bring i wanted to kind of wanted to bring the team back together and i wanted to reunite with reese fulber because there was a i think there was a couple of records on archetype and transgression where i think i think on transgression that reese didn't work on the album at all but i think on archetype you might have had a couple of songs he worked on but i wanted him to bring them back in full production mode and full um um, on those records. So I'm mechanizing the industrialist, Reese forward all the programming, or at least the most of it. And I got another guy named Blush Response who I use later on in remixes. Um, he ended up doing some programming. And uh, um, yeah, so I ended up bringing the team back and using Greg Reilly, who mixed D Manufacturer Obsolete, bringing him back to mix Mechanize, bringing Reese forward back on the production duties and the. Uh, the programming, same thing on the industrialist, you know, and uh, yeah, so it was killer. So I'm glad I brought the team back together. Yeah, yeah, and I love like the concepts, like like with that with uh, Genexus talk about like war, climate change, and religion. With with the con with this concept, did you ever have to almost have to like like do like research that goes along with the make with these kind of concepts? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, like the song, like the title of the industrialist came from. The industrialists came from what they call guys who run these big factories where they do big, like big things. Like I, I saw a documentary on the on what they call the industrialists, guys who manufacture big, big things for industrial type of stuff, right? Um, big mechanical stuff, you know, big gigantic caterpillars and just uh, you know oil rigs and just guys who manufacture that machinery. They call them the industrialist. And so I thought that was great. <coughs> and so basically the industrialist is an automaton fighting for more life, but it's also the create the creation of this automaton, the manufacturing companies that are the industrialists that are creating these automatons. And that's kind of like where we were going. Mechanized was kind of like how society is becoming more mechanized. And so how we how we've changed from obsolete to mechanized where things were becoming obsolete, man was becoming obsolete, where on mechani mechanized, man had become mechanized. So, and then the, the industrialists, they totally went even more to a futuristic concept of where we were actually manufacturing automatons for everyday life, whether it's war, um, whether it's, you know, for sex robots, you name it, we were manufacturing them. Policing, policing, you know, the you know, the streets. Um, and then going into Genexus, you know, autonomous combat system that goes into more of, you know, uh, creating these automatons for, um, for war. Right. And then, um, and that battle, and then, you know, towards the end of the record, you know, you get the songs like expiration date, because all these automatons definitely have an expiration date. They have a shelf life. Yeah. And then, of course, your most recent album, Aggression Continuum, I, I think is a pr pretty good good album. One of my favorite albums from last year. What was that whole, like, going from Genexus and the Aggression Continuum? That was, that was, like, an insane record to make because of all the uh, legal drama that we went through uh, yeah. to, do, to do that record and just you know every both of mine and burton's lives being changed right yeah. um whether it was you know we we were both going through divorces we were both going through lawsuits um you know bankruptcies uh uh trial i went to, i went to trial and it was just brutal it was just for the the fight the fight for money 
it was a, a you know Raymond and Christian were suing us each for a million dollars so and damages and just whatever just it was just insane insane time to try to make a record but I ended up working with a guy named Damien Raynaud. Now, Damien Raynaud is a French engineer slash producer slash mixer slash master. So he does it. He pretty much does it all. And I started working with him back in the industrial days, back in 2011. Um, he helped um, do a lot, do some of the keyboards and some of the some of the drum programming, and um, he helped with some of the pre mixes on the album. And he just did, he was just a, a behind the scenes kind of guy who worked on worked with us on the record, and then going into Genexus, you know, I teamed up with him to do all the to the the pre production on the album, all of it, um, and then um, I also used used a guy named uh, Giuseppe Bassi who I used later on. He appeared on uh, Genexus as well on some of the tracks, uh, the programmer. Um, anyway, so then uh, when it came to Aggression Continuum, I decided, okay, I'm gonna work with uh, Damon Raynaud for the, all, for the whole production of the record. Um, so it was me and him co-producing the album. And um, the approach on this record was to make it as aggressive as possible, right? Yeah, hence the time. Um, yeah, exactly. I wanted to go back to some killer riffing, something just, just some raw, you know, emotional, just you know, angry type of stuff. I mean, you can hear from the first track, the first, the first um, vocal line. Imagine your life taken from you. You know, that was the the big thing. So um, that pretty much says it all for the whole record, you know, because we felt, because we didn't know where we were going to be at. We didn't know if we were going to be able to continue Fear Factory. We didn't know um, what was going to happen. So luckily I ended up winning my lawsuit and uh, things didn't turn out so well for Burton and his lawsuit. And a lot of his assets went up for sale. And one of those assets was his rights to the trademark Fear Factory. So I ended up purchasing um, the, the the court system, put his assets in, and I was able to purchase his half of the name to own full ownership of the Fear Factory trademark name. And I did that so we can continue uh, with Fear Factory. But Bert decided to quit the band for whatever reason, and yeah. that was it. So that was it. So here I was. I was left with a record, a Russian Continuum, and it had, I had a different guy mixing the album, but I, Andy Sneak, but I had a guy named Chris Collier who mixed the album, and um, and I got had a uh, Mike Plotnikoff who worked on DJ Immortal with us, doing some of the tracking for the album. So I just didn't feel that, even though the album was mixed, I just didn't feel that it was, it was ready. I didn't feel it was, it was, it was, uh, it was just, I didn't feel it was done. Right. So basically after I got ownership of the name, I got the record back. Um, so I was able to take the record and pretty much reproduce it. Um, the record label wasn't going to give me any more money for it at the time, you know, cause they really had given us a lot of money, but a lot of the money that Bert and I got, you know, went into fighting a lot of the legal went into covering a lot of the legal fees. So our production money had pretty much run out. So I did start a GoFundMe campaign just to finish the album. Um, and luckily the fans really came through and, you know, helped out with that, with that money. So I could, I, I can finish the production on the album. So basically I went back to Damien Reno. We, you know, changed a lot of the drums. Mike Plotnikoff played drums because originally the song had programming, drum programming. So I had Mike Plot. I'm sorry. I had a Mike Heller play the live drums on the album, um, which made a big difference. Um, I also um, had Mike Heller redo the drums on the Industrious, the live record. Uh, I'm sorry, the live drums on that record. That's going to be coming out next 
it's called reindustrialized. So that's the first time you heard it here. So oh. reindustrialized for industrialists and exclusive with exclusive. drums, with drums. Yeah. So anyway, so I had so going back to aggression continuum, I had Mike Keller play the live drums. Um, I had you know um, a guy named Giuseppe Bassi again add some more keyboards. I had um, Reese Forber add a lot of the keyboards on the record. Um, and I had, you know, me and Damien worked on a lot of the keyboards on the album. And it's just, we added a lot more stuff. I had Igor Kreshkov from the band. Yes. He did a lot of the keyboards on the record. So I had various different guys adding keyboards. And I think that's one of the reasons why the record came out. So, you know, especially with a song like Recode cinematic. Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course the the big news. I'm pretty sure sure you probably get sick of asking this is about about why why Burton left because I know I watched your interview with uh, Rob Flint, Flint, which apparently it took place like hours, and apparently you found out through social media. Yeah, well, I could see over the years that he was always had one foot out the door. You know what I mean? He was always um, that guy. I mean, you know, he originally quit way back in 2002, yeah, right? Yeah. And he ended up coming back into the band and restarting the band with the other guys without me. <clears throat> at least that's what I at least that's what I thought but I don't know I never really got the full story of why they did what they did but to me it always seemed like he always had one foot out the door and um, I think that this was just his time to exit whatever for whatever reason I mean you'd have to ask him really to get yeah. to get it but you know he pretty much left me uh he left me uh, to, to handle the rest of the duties for Aggression Continuum. And so now I'm moving forward without him, and the band's going to keep going without him, and that's just how it is. Right. And I'm pretty sure the... He's moved, he's moved on, and so have I. I mean, right. you know, fans, you fans can cry all they want, and people can just, you know, want what they want. And I get it. I understand. He was in the band for many years, and he was the only vocalist on the record, even though... He had quit the band two or three times um, uh, before that, uh, but he, you know, he, he's 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 gone, and I've moved on, and so has he. All right, and I'm pretty sure the, the another question that I'm pretty sure everybody's been asking is who's the new singer because there's got to be big sho shoes to fill. Of course, uh, there's going to be um, big shoes to fill, um, but I'm not afraid. Been there before. I'm ready to move on forward. I, I look forward to it. I think it's going to be fucking ripping. It's going to be killer. I'm going to put out some more heavy shit. So, you know, I don't think anybody needs to worry. So, I mean, the vocalist I got is amazing. He's, uh, he's, you know, younger and he's, he's in his mid thirties. He's at his, he's at his vocal peak. I think he's, he's there and ready to go. So, yeah. So I'm not. We're not making any announcements yet, but yeah. people will hear about it soon. Yeah, he'll tell me when I turn the recorder off. <laughs> yeah, um, we have um, a tour starting in February, the Static February 24th. That at Fear Factory, Static X, Mushroom Head, Dope, um, and it's going to be a killer tour. I can't wait to get out there, and it's going to be cool. It's going to be cold as fuck because it's going to be the winter yeah. here in. <laughs> Yeah, it's United like States. 14 degrees here in Georgia, so I definitely it's still cold here. Yeah, so uh, it's it's already 120, so I'm gonna have to get going. So oh shit! So at the yeah. uh, so kind of like wrapping things up, is up, is up. I just want to say thank you. It's just any closing words you want to say? I want to say thank you for all the fans who've supported me through thick and thin, through all the drama and all the bullshit that's gone on. Um, I'm still here. I'm still my heart and soul is still here in Fear Factory. Uh, where I started, and um, it's gonna. I, I look forward to 2023, 2024. Um, there will be there will be a new record. We're gonna go into the recording studio and finish the production in July. Uh, August. Um, me and Damien Renault are working on the record as we speak. Well, not now because it's Christmas holidays, but we'll get back into it in January um, and look forward to the tour in February. So. I appreciate everybody who's given me the support and who is behind me and who's looking forward to the future. Awesome. So everybody, Dino Cazares from Fear Factory, see you next time.